Hi everyone, it's Daisy here with another YouTube video. Today's video is going to be all about why Urushi Makie pens from Namiki are so expensive. This is a topic that I've been wanting to do a video on for a long time and um, I've been inspired recently by Amy on our team who's been writing a blog post on this very topic and she's very passionate about fountain pens and um, has an art background herself so I I thought she'd be the perfect person to write that blog post and she's been writing it and doing a great job with all this research. Today's video is going to cover the different techniques that go into making Namiki fountain pens and why they are so expensive. We're also going to be talking about the history of Namiki as well as um, some background on the beginnings of Namiki and just kind of like the materials that go into making these fountain pens in general. Before we start, I have to recognize the fact that expensive is definitely a relative term and if you're new to fountain pens Expensive can mean uh, $50 for you, it can mean $100, and fountain pens have a really wide range of prices. So before I dive in and talk about Namiki fountain pens, which are often in the thousands of dollars, I would give a brief overview of some of the different price points that fountain pens are available in because you can really get a really good fountain pen at a great price, like $10, $20, uh, $30 would get you a great fountain pen. So a starter fountain pen in the store, we typically offer anything between $5 and $50. And um, this will get you a, a steel nib fountain pen, which will be durable and uh, reliable, will write great for you under many different circumstances. And I myself and everyone on our team has steel and fountain pens that we use every single day and that we love. Twisbees are my go-to brand for steel and fountain pens and I know other people at our company have other steel and fountain pens. So five to fifty dollars for steel and fountain pens and then as you introduce more advanced filling mechanisms, advanced materials, you might find yourself looking at a steel and fountain pen for a hundred dollars or hundred fifty dollars. Um, then we have gold nib fountain pens that are made out of 14 karat, 18 karat, 21 karat gold and those will run you anywhere from, I would say, $150 to maybe $300, $400. Um, and then on top of that, we do often get limited edition pens, special edition pens. There's antique pens and rare fountain pens, and those will be a lot more anytime you find something that's limited edition or special edition or rare pen in general. It will add more to that dollar sign. Today's video is going to be on a, um, a category of pens that I like to call art pens. Pens. And these are like handmade, really special pens that employ extremely time intensive uh, techniques to make, as well as really costly materials to make. And today's video are by Pilot Namiki and why they are so expensive. So, before we get into that, a little bit about the history of Pilot Namiki and what Pilot Namiki is. Pilot Namiki pens uh, started in 1925. Pilot itself started in 1918 and for those of you who don't know this about fountain pen history back then in the 1910s and the 1920s fountain pens were often made of a material called ebonite which was a sulfurized uh, vulcanized um, rubber which made rubber really really durable and lightweight at the same time as a material for a fountain pen so you had a really durable fountain pen that was really lightweight and relatively affordable for the time and um, ebonite's fountain pens were the most common material for fountain pens back in the back in those times the only drawback of ebonite fountain pens was that they would sort of fade in color over time and as a result the Miki back in 1925 had the idea of introducing urushi lacquer on top of ebonite fountain pens urushi is a lacquer sap that is uh, tapped from trees and it has been used in East Asian arts. Um, it's often used on furniture and sort of like little decorative items wealthy people would use to like decorate their homes. So Urushi was combined with the material of ebonite to make fountain pens a little bit 
uh, more durable and make ebonite a longer lasting material for fountain pens. So that is how Namiki got started in 1925. And then in 1931, Namiki actually began a group called Kokokai, which literally translates to the nation's light abroad. And the whole idea of this was a group of artisans that specialized in ubushi arts and makie arts, which we'll talk more about later. They would specialize in that and uh, introduce these pilot Nibiki pens uh, covered in these traditional Japanese arts uh, to fountain pen users or pen users across the world because back then fountain pens were just the pens. So um, that was their whole idea is that uh, Kokokai would introduce this fine Japanese art um, on a very sort of everyday uh, item that would be in everybody's household. And that is why this group of artisans today is still called Kokokai. Today, Pilots Namiki Kokokai group consists of just 19 artists. So it's a really a uh, special craft that is preserved and it is treasured among the nation. So this group of 19 artisans actually hand makes all of Pilot Namiki's Rushi pens. Here on this tray, I do have a, some, a little snapshot of some of these Namiki pens that we're gonna be covering in today's video. And so all of these pens are actually made by one of those 19 group of artisans from Kokokai. Each of these found pens features a signature so I'll pick one up each of these fountain pens features the signature of the artisan of the craftsperson who is responsible for producing and really taking their time to make this very piece so I really think of these as art pens and that is for sure part of the reason why they come with such a high price tag on top of that there are four additional reasons that we're going to talk about in this video um, the first being the urushi itself we'll talk about the second Second being the actual techniques that are used on these pens to produce these elaborate designs. The third reason is the use of gold nibs. And then the fourth reason is the use of the special materials in the pen bodies. We'll start with the Urushi lacquer. So all of these pens on this tray here are actually Urushi pens. And for those of you who don't know what Urushi is, Urushi is a lacquer that is harvested from a sap of a tree. Urushi trees are grown. Um, it takes 10 or 15 years for them to reach maturity level. And the, the sap on a tree can only be harvested between a very specific season. I think the harvest season is like June or September, June to September of a year. Um, the sap is harvested over the course of all of these months and collectively one tree can produce just shy of one cup of sap. So this is like a very precious material. It's very, um, time consuming to grow an urushi tree and to harvest that sap itself also takes a tremendous amount of time. After the tree is tapped of the sap during that growing season, it's it's chopped down, it's axed down so that um, it can grow again and they can also replant new trees to uh, harvest more sap in the future. Harvesting the urushi sap itself is a very time intensive thing and the urushi sap it's, itself is a rare commodity, I guess, um, and it's used very sparingly on these pens um, and just covering it all over the pens actually takes a lot of time. So the top reason for these pens being so expensive and the most straightforward is just the use of urushi lacquer itself. The second reason that these pens are so expensive has to do with the different techniques, the handwork techniques that are used and applied along the barrels of these pens to apply the artwork. So a lot of the artwork on these Namiki pens feature Japanese motifs, very traditional uh, motifs of animals and nature that are symbolic for things like prosperity and fortune and health. Um, things that bring good luck and such. So these are very sort of traditional motifs that are featured along all of these barrels. We're actually gonna be having Amy, who did a lot of the research on the techniques, tell us a little bit more about each of the techniques. But to just give you an overview of the techniques, all of the different makie techniques have to do with 
either uh, applying the artwork on the surface of the pen or polishing the pen surface to expose the artwork itself. And maquillé, the word maquillé actually means sprinkled picture. So it's the use of sort of gold and silver and precious metal powders on top of the pen um, and polishing the pen down and down and doing it repeatedly over the course of many months to achieve this finished picture. So the different techniques that we're gonna talk about today are Hira Makie, Togadashi Makie, Togadashi Hira Makie, Togadashi Taka Makie. So these are the different techniques and they all kind of have to do with either applying the artwork on the surface of the pen or applying the artwork, covering it with something and then burnishing it down, polishing it down to expose the artwork um, on these pens. So the resulting picture that you see on these pens is either a stunning motif of a very traditional Japanese motif along the pen barrel like this and the cap, or a more subtle rendition of a motif that has been um, polished away at over many, many, many repetitions of polishing and application, polishing and application. And what that achieves is sort of like a depth in the artwork. And so Amy's gonna come on and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different techniques and show you specific examples of each of the techniques. I learned so much from Amy's blog post and I really have to give her a shout out. She did a great job with it. And for the first time, I will say, I can now identify um, just by looking at a pen what each of the different techniques are and that is something that was always a little intimidating to me before. So I hope that this video will help you do the same. Amy, can you show us the um, Yukari Royale? So this is the Namiki Yukari Royale Urushi Vermilion. The Royo Urushi Shiage technique, it involves a lot of repeated polishing with a special charcoal powder and then repeated rubbing in of more raw lacquer to achieve a really smooth and glossy finish. Mm. And this one is vermilion, but there is also a black one, right? Yes. Which one is this? Uh, that one is the Namiki Emperor. The black Urushi version. Mm -hmm. And they're both, I guess, um, the, what, one of the features of the Royuro Urushi uh, Shiyagi styles is really just this kind of like solid color, uh, very polished appearance. Yeah, they don't use any uh, makie ornamentation, mm -hmm. I guess, to add to the design. Mm -hmm. So really just the, the depth and gloss of the finish mm -hmm. is what you admire here. Cool. Next, your maquillé is the flat maquillé technique, right? Mm -hmm. Which pen is this, Amy? So that's the Namiki Nippon Art Golden Pheasant. So in the Hira Makie technique, uh, the pen is, has already been lacquered and once it's dried, a design is painted onto a dry lacquered surface with wet lacquer and then uh, gold and other metal powders are sprinkled onto it using a bamboo tube. And then once that powder, once the lacquer has dried, the excess powder is brushed away and then it's finally sealed with additional layers of clear lacquer. Oh, okay. So the pheasants are um, basically powder? Uh, yeah, they're made through gold powder. So first under the pheasants, they would paint with lacquer. Yeah, paint, painting the shape mm -hmm. in wet lacquer and then sprinkling the gold powder directly into it so that it adheres. Otherwise it would just fall off. Right? Mm -hmm. And they have, I guess, powder in like different colors, right? Mm -hmm. There are like gold and silver and other metal powders and then um, some of the details are actually painted on with um, colored lacquer. Like I'm pretty sure those red, green, and blue details, they're just painted straight on in colored mm. lacquer, which is the Arushi lacquer mixed with pigments like iron oxide, for example, to give it that color. I see. Thank you. The next technique that we're talking about is the Togidashi Makie, which is the burnished Makie. And the fountain pen that features the burnished Makie style is this pen right here. So this is the Namiki Aya in Hayate Black. Hayate means gale, so the imagery is inspired by 
gusts of wind. Togidashi makie refers to the uh, makie technique in which after the design is created with the gold, silver, or other metal powders, the entire pen is coated in a layer of black urushi lacquer, which after drying is then burnished with charcoal to just subtly reveal the gold powder has been gold underneath. So in this pen, all of these uh, gold powders would have been covered at one time in urushi lacquer um, before the charcoal kind of scraped away the lacquer to reveal these subtle layers. Yeah, I think that's the nicest part about this technique is just the really subtle depth you can achieve. Mm -hmm. It's so pretty and I love how on this pen, because it's like a flat um, bottom and a flat top, the powder they even use on the surface of the, 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 the bottom of the pen there, the base of the pen, as well as the top of the pen, the cap. The next technique that we're talking about is the Togidashi Hira Makie Burnished Flat Makie technique and the pen we are talking about is this one here. This is the Miki Yukari Grapevine and this uses the Togidashi Hira Makie technique which is burnished flat makie. We were just talking about Togidashi Makie, uh, the process in which the image is sort of gradually, the gold powder is gradually revealed after burnishing away a layer of black lacquer. And so here you can see the gold powder sort of in the background has that effect where it sort of gradually shimmers through the blackness as created through Togidashi Makie. While the primary main design, like the grapevines and the leaves, are created through Hira Makie or Flat Makie. So then in this in this style, the grapevines and the leaves would be um, the top layer and that's why it's not completely smooth. So actually the burnished part of it is completely smooth and it just feels like lacquer with the rest of the pen. And the motif, which is done with Hira Makie, is actually raised. Yeah, sense. and it lets you achieve a really amazing impression of depth. Mm. Like the background parts are, are literally further in the background. Literally. Next technique we're talking about is the Togidashi Taka Makie style, the burnished raised Makie. So this is Namiki Yukari Turtles. This one we don't have right now. Uh, Namiki Yukari Turtles uses Togidashi Taka Makie, which combines Togidashi Makie with Taka Makie, which means raised Makie. And that is a technique in which after the design is painted on, uh, the surface is actually built up through the application of a mix of lacquer and charcoal powder to create a sort of raised design. Here you can see in, on the shell of the turtle that the shell actually looks somewhat three-dimensional. It's a little bit hard to see without the pen here, but you can see that the shell itself has that kind of dimensionality as well as some of the other details of the turtle. Um, so you can see sort of the, almost the outline of the shell between the tiles that sort of don't have the sprinkled gold powder detailing. When you touch the pen, those parts will actually feel depressed, like there's a groove. While the sort of tiles themselves, I wish I knew more turtle terminology here, but the tiles feel somewhat <laughs> raised. So it's actually it's actually very textured, although it's still smooth because afterwards, of course, it's finished with layers of clear lacquer to a beautiful shine. Nice. Yeah. This one was really beautiful. I remember when I when we had it. Mm -hmm. The next technique we're talking about is the chinking technique. Which head is it? So this is an Amiki Chinkin cat. This uses the Chinkin technique, which is not a Makie technique because Makie techniques involve the sprinkling of metal powders over lacquer to create a design. This actually involves uh, chiseling out the design very carefully with very special chisels and that this creates grooves. Then lacquer, wet lacquer is applied to these grooves and gold powder is inlaid into it. So after it dries, the excess powder is removed and then you have the, the powder sticks inside the grooves, allowing the image to, 
to emerge. They're created through a very precise carving technique, mm -hmm. sort of the opposite of the additive process of maquillage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can actually feel some of the grooves. These are um, very discreet grooves as opposed to some of the other chinking pens that we have, but all the Niki chinking uh, grooves are are definitely their a tactile feeling. Um, you feel little bumps along the carvings, but um, very kind of discreet. So it's not like it still feels overall very smooth on the surface of the pen. Yeah, it's sort of like a pointillist painting where okay. from far away it's a very, it's a, well, you know, from far away yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. a very discreet image. And then when you go up close, you can see that the images are really constrict. Like the shading is all accomplished through a lot of tiny dots of varying like sizes and densities mm -hmm. and, um, and lines for the more linear details. The next technique that we're talking about with Namiki pens is Raiden. This pen is Namiki Yukari Firefly. And Firefly uses the Tokidashi Makie technique as well as Raiden, which is inlaid abalone shell. Raiden uses the sort of like mother of pearl shiny parts from the iridescent inner layer of mollusks, shelled, shelled animals, right? Mm -hmm. And basically tiny little fragments of these shells are inlaid into the surface of these pens to create these very um, detailed designs. Sometimes if thicker pieces are used, then they have to be, they really have to be inlaid in. Like a space has to be carved into the pen first, and then the shell will be sort of fitted in and then lacquered over. But with thinner pieces, they can just be adhered to the surface with lacquer, and then of course, layered over and polished. But here you can see the sprinkled gold powder and Tokide Maki A work in the back while well, just several blades of grass and the body of the firefly are highlighted in Raiden. Gotcha. So here's where we have some Raiden work here, with the iridescent shell, and on this blade of grass here, as well as this body of this firefly and these blades of grass, and then all of the kind of gold sprinkled colors, that is where we see the togidashi makie work, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that was a little bit about the Machie techniques that go into why some of these found pens are so expensive. And another thing that goes into why these pens are so expensive is the gold nib. So we talked a little bit about how golden found pens can be anywhere from $150 to upwards of that. Well, these found pens, the Namiki, Pilot Namiki found pens are, go beyond just the gold nib. They are often a very large gold nib, depending on the size of the pen. So for example, the Emperor pen over here features a number 50 nib, which is really ginormous. And as you can imagine, it uses um, 18 karat gold. So the more gold that you need to use for a larger pen, really the more expensive some of these pens will be. And these pens come with pilot number 10, pilot number 20, 30, or 50 nibs in either 14 karat gold and 18 karat gold. And the larger the nib you get and the higher the, the gold, the purity of the gold, the 18 karat, it, it correlates to a higher price tag. So that's another slight, that's another reason why some of these have also price differences within even the Pilot Namiki is because of the gold nib itself. Last factor that goes into making these pens more expensive is the material of the body itself. So these pens are made of either brass or ebonite. The smaller pen bodies are made of metal brass so that they have quite a bit of weight to them when you hold them in your hand and they feel substantial. And then the largest pens, such as this Emperor and the Eye of Found pen, which are really ginormous. They're like, they're like the length of my face. Um, <laughs> 
These pens are huge, so it wouldn't make any sense to make them in brass because they would be non-functional. So these are made of ebonite. And while ebonite was a really common material to make fountain pens in, um, in the 1920s and the 1910s, Today, ebonite is actually quite an expensive material to make, and um, it, it's not a very machine-friendly material. So when it comes to making ebonite things, such as an ebonite feed, you really have to do that by hand and use use the tools by hand on the on the body of the pen, on the feed. So that is another reason why some of the pe these pens have a higher price tag. So those four reasons, you have the Urushi lacquer, the precious Urushi lacquer, the very tiny intensive and labor intensive um, techniques of Machie, um, the gold nibs, the material of the gold nibs, as well as the material of the pen body on some of these really large pens. That is why these fountain pens are so precious, so expensive, and um, why they're so special and many people choose to collect them. Now we're going to be giving you an overview of the different collections from Pilot Namiki because the different collections, and there are a few, there's the Urushi collections, there's the U Yukari collection, Yukari Royale, there's the Chin King collection. These collections are a little bit mind boggling to me at first because some of them have to do with technique, some of them have to do with the technique and the size of the pen, and some of them have to do with just the size of the pen. So in order to shed a little bit of light on the Pilot Namiki fountain pen collections, we have Amy again to just talk us through some of the different collections and to explain how to decode these collections a little bit so that hopefully you won't just hear, hear a jumble of Japanese words the next time we talk about a Pilot Namiki collection. <laughs> so Amy, now we have a bunch of the different uh, Pilot Namiki fountain pens here on this tray in front of us, and Pilot Namiki pens kind of span several different collections. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about what each of those collections mean, because there's lots of different sort of words thrown in there, like Yukari and um, Royale, <laughs> words that people might not know what the meanings are. So starting from these pens here, uh, what are these? So these two pens are in Namiki's Urushi collection. These two are pens in Namiki's Urushi collection. They, this collection only has four pens in it right now and they are two different sizes, the Yukari Royale size and the Emperor size. Pens in this collection are not Makie pens, they are Urushi pens that use Roryuro Urushi Shiage to show off the beauty of the Urushi lacquer itself. Right, and so this pen here is Yukari Royale size, so it's like smaller, and this size over here is the larger Emperor size, right? So Urushi collection contains pens of different sizes, but they all use that same Roiro Urushi Shiyage technique. This pen here is in the Namiki Nippon Art Collection. The Nippon Art Collection pens feature Hira Makie or Flat Makie, which we talked about earlier. They are the same size as the pens in the Yukari collection. So the Yukari collection pens are here, and yeah, they are the same size. So we have a Nippon Art Collection pen here and a Yukari Collection pen here, and they're actually the same size, but they use different techniques. And the Nippon Art Collection pens also have a 14 karat number 10 nib rather than an 18 karat number 10 nib, ah, okay. which the Yukari collection has. So even though these two pens are the same size, one is in the Yukari collection and one of them, this one, is in the Nippon Art collection and they are the same overall size in the barrel, what you're saying is that the nib sizes are 14 karat versus 18 karat and obviously this one on the Yukari collection also has this bicolor nib. So there's a little bit uh, of a price difference between those two collections, right? Yes. Gotcha. All right, next up, these two pens are in the Namiki Chinkin collection, right? So tell us a little bit about the Chinkin collection. The Chinkin collection features pens of various sizes that all use the Chinkin or gold inlay technique that we described earlier. 
The pens here are a Namiki Yukari Royale pen and a Namiki Yukari pen that features flat ends as opposed to the round ones that we've seen elsewhere. So they are two distinct sizes, but they both use the Chinkin technique and are both in the Chinkin collection. Mm. And there's probably also even other other sizes outside of this for the Chinkin collection, right? Yes, there are also Chinkin emperors. Mm. Cool. The biggest yeah. ones. Yes. We have some various Yukari pens. Pens in the Yukari collection are all the same size and feature the same size nib, which is a number 10, 18 karat gold nib. They also feature various makie techniques like togidashi makie and togidashi hira makie. Um, Namiki Yukari Turtles also features togidashi taka makie. So they all have some of the uh, more, somewhat more advanced makie techniques. With that 18 karat nib. With that 18 karat nib. Yep. Cool. This one is the Namiki Aya. The Namiki Aya collection is actually pretty new. It launched in February 2023, and there are only four pens in this collection right now. The pens in the Namiki Aya collection are all a distinct size. That is the second largest size after the Emperor, so it's larger even than the Yukari Royale. They also have a number 30 nib which is larger than the Yukari Royale's number 20, but still smaller than the Emperor's number 50. And this nib size is shared by the Custom Arushi, which I think launched just a few years ago. And um, the number 30 was a new nib size that launched along with it, which is now shared by the Namiki Aya. And the pens in these collections use Tokidashi Makie. So are there additional Namiki collections outside of these collections that we just talked about? Yes, there is also a Yukari Royale collection, which features pens that are all the Yukari Royale size that are decorated with various advanced togidashi techniques like togidashi takamakie. There's also an emperor collection of emperor sized pens also featuring- So like this size, emperor sized. Yes. Yeah. And so the emperor collection also features only the most advanced Makie techniques hmm. and very elaborate designs. Cool. Um, I'm sure we'll get those eventually, okay. right? <laughs> so out of all of these pens, Amy, which one is your favorite? So my favorite is Namiki Yukari Firefly. Namiki Yukari Firefly is my favorite because the, the size of the pen itself is more comfortable for my hands. Mm. while the brass body also gives it enough weight to sort of balance out the smaller size so it still feels substantial in the hand. And I like that it is it somewhat it kind of has a simpler design too with a lot of breathing room and space to <laughs> Yeah, it definitely it definitely has a more simple design than some of these like super flashy ones that could be like on a like a, on a tapestry, you know. <laughs> the other ones I do really really love to look at, yeah. but I think I would maybe find them distracting yeah. when it came to actually writing. Mm. So I think this one has the perfect balance for me uh, of simplicity and also some kind of stunning details like the the little Raiden blades of grass and the bodies of the fireflies. Mm -hmm. Can you hold it in your hand for us and show us like what it looks like in your hand? In your hand. Yeah, because some of these pens, like this one, would be like. Can you imagine holding that? No, one? Like, I can't. That is like crazy. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know who that's can write with an emperor comfortably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why they're made out of ebonite. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they'd be so heavy. Yeah, so yeah. heavy. That's a nice maybe little size may comparison. Maybe they're like not that different in weight because this one's brass. Really? Yeah, I don't know. Well, you try. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, but this is kind still like funny. way too large. It's just it's, it's just way too large. It's hand, about the yeah. size more than the weight. I feel like it's sometimes heavy pens will cramp up your hand. Sometimes pens that are too large or too small will cramp up your hand. And that one's too large for yeah. me. Yeah, gotta find the perfect pen. So that's why that one's And good. this is it. Mm -hmm. This is Amy's Grail pen. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, Amy.
Yes, what is your favorite one, Daisy? If you're not gonna copy me and go for Firefly. Well, actually, I am quite smitten with Firefly after reading Amy's blog post about this beautiful, cute little pen. And plus, like, it's a really, it's just a really cute motif. Fireflies, but I think a longtime favorite of mine has been the shooting star one. Um, I love these little planets, these little, uh, I don't know if those are supposed to be planets or stars, but they're definitely like some kind of solar system thing um, in Raiden and just like perfect circle in Raiden is very pleasing. It's like a big chunk of Raiden. Um, and then there's like these little dots of Raiden throughout the pen that as you rotate the pen, they just reflect light so subtly. So I think that's really beautiful because Raiden can sometimes be very in your face, <laughs> but I appreciate the little specks of Raiden. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, and then mm -hmm. the, these little shooting star motifs. Yeah. So there's like little uh, lines of Togidashi Makie. And the different colors yeah. you get through the Raiden, that's really stunning. Yeah, I wonder, I guess like somebody has to like sort through different colors of Raiden. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is the blue Raiden. This different is flakes the, of yeah. abalone shell. This is the iridescent one. So I do love this one. And you're right, this is a good size, I think, for us. I don't know if we have like the same size hands. Here's my hand, I'm Daisy, are, I'm, I'm that's Amy. Amy's. Hello everyone, <laughs> hello. <laughs> You're such a hand. Yeah. Like. Um, yeah, and yeah, these are just like good size pens for our hand versus some of these other large pens, which would be too big. Thanks Amy. Thanks Daisy. It's, it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around in the beginning, and I do hope that our explanations of these techniques really help you to appreciate them because I, I'm now able to appreciate these pens more than ever now that I can actually identify, oh, this is where they use togidashi, and this is where they actually use the togidashi raised, um, the raised style of togidashi, and so on and so forth. And now that I can identify each of those different techniques, I can really imagine like what it took to make one of these fountain pens. And it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work. So I, I do hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a comment if you enjoyed this explanation and if we helped you understand these fountain pens a little bit better. Thank you so much for watching. And if there's anything that we left out, let us know in the comments and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Thank you, bye.